Well, please turn now to Luke chapter 1, and we'll be walking through verses 67 through 71. I know many of you had hoped that we'd walk through verse 80. I intended to walk through verse 80, and then I began to see some of the covenants that we had here in front of us, and I remembered that I wanted to take some time on these covenants. And so I'm not going to rush through them. I'm going to take some time and walk through two very specific covenants that we see within this prophecy, this, this song, this Benedictus, that is from Zechariah during this time. And we're going to take some time and walk through the Davidic covenant and the Abrahamic covenant. We'll talk about the Davidic covenant today. And next Sunday, God willing, we'll talk about the Abrahamic covenant. We'll talk about in what ways these are fulfilled in Christ Jesus, because they both point to Christ. Gabriel has brought this up. Mary has brought this up. And now Zechariah has both of these covenants contained here in the prophecy that he gives. So let's go ahead and read the beginning portion of this prophecy, beginning in verse 67. It says, And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his Holy Spirit, prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. I'll go ahead and read through the rest of the prophecy, but we'll only be walking through verse 71 today. And he, he continues, he says, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give us light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel." So, this is Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, and he gives this great prophecy at this time. And as you remember, this is after months of silence. He could not hear, and he could not speak. It's not always clear to see that within uh, the words that are here, but the, the language that is written in conveys that idea that he was not able to speak, he was not able to hear, and then you especially see that in the fact that they handed him a writing pad, or he called for a writing pad, and they were making signs to him. So he wasn't able to hear them, and he wasn't able to speak. So after months of silence, Zechariah is now speaking. He is filled with the Holy Spirit during this time. And it's noteworthy to recognize that the Spirit is filling him at this time. He is speaking these words of prophecy, but the Holy Spirit had been working in the life of Elizabeth just six months earlier. She was filled with the Holy Spirit. She was speaking prophetically, and Elizabeth's heart was trusting in the Lord during this time, and Zechariah was showing faithlessness during this time. He was not trusting the word of the Lord that the angel had brought to him, but the Lord in his time accomplished his good work providentially through his means. And he had silenced Zechariah during this time. He had made it so that Zechariah could not hear. He could not hear. He could not speak because he was the one who was not listening. He was one who was not believing this. That's why he lost these natural abilities, was because of his lack of faith. He was not believing upon the Lord's promise. As we said previously, this was a priest. This is someone who was communicating the blessings of the Lord's promise there in the ceremonial law, there in, in the ceremonial festivities of Israel each and every year, there at the Feast of Tabernacles, there during the Day of Atonement, remembering, reflecting upon the Lord's mercies that He had shown to the people of God over and over, the times in which the Lord had shown great and incredible mercy to them. 
and by the way, not working through normal natural means in accomplishing these. Zechariah here is communicating, he's communicating through writing, something that if we think upon, he probably was doing quite a bit of writing during this time. That's probably how he and his wife were communicating. Probably a lot more thought was going into what they were saying one to another as they were writing out everything that they had to say. It's, it's a time that though they're in the latter part of their life, they would never forget this experience and how the Lord had worked in their lives during this time. And we know that he was writing to Elizabeth because she knew the child's name. Remember, she said his name should be called John. And he had to come forward and say his name is John. He was silenced because of his unbelief, but he is speaking now. He is believing here after the child is born. I do want to make a note, verses 68 through 75 are one complete sentence in Greek. I'm not even going to walk through the entirety of that sentence because I want to deal with the Davidic covenant in this sermon. I want to deal with the Abrahamic covenant in the next one. I want you to see in this, this prophecy, this point that is here, of the visitation of the Lord in its fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. This is a covenant that was given in times past, a covenant that was made with David, a promise the Lord had made, and the writers here are seeing a fulfillment Zechariah here is seeing a fulfillment of what the Lord is going to do, and he's speaking of it, I want you to see, as we walk through it, as though it's already happened. You see that many times in prophecy, many times when people are speaking of what the Lord will do, they will speak of it as though He has done it. So, two points that I want you to gather from this, and they both have their theme in redemption, the redemption that the Lord is working here for His people. So, we have the redemptive visitation, and we have the redemptive covenant, this visitation of the Lord meeting with His people, the Lord condescending to His people here through Christ Jesus. This one that John speaks of, that clothes Himself in flesh and tabernacles amongst us, gathers amongst the people. John very intentionally use that type of language, this language that's hearkening us back to Eden when God and man were walking one with another. That, that tabernacling language that is there in Eden is being communicated about Christ Jesus, this visitation that is happening from the Lord. And then this redemptive covenant, this Davidic covenant, this, this covenant that the Lord makes with David that there will be one who will sit upon the throne of David. And as you sing it, if you do sing it each and every Christmas time, we'll sit there forever and ever and ever as we sing so oftentimes in the Handel's Messiah. And if you haven't done that, I would encourage you at some point to participate in singing Handel's Messiah. It is fascinating the amount of Scripture that is contained there within that music. So let's start with that first point, the, the redemptive visitation there in 67 and 68 of Luke chapter 1. It says, And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Now, this is something that I've noticed throughout the years, and I know some of you may have an interest in this. Some of you may find all of this activity and speculation really, really bizarre. But either way, it is there before us, and it is honestly ubiquitous within our culture. And there are many who go to great lengths to, to search and to study the possibility of life on other planets, looking for extraterrestrials. I had a friend in early, early in my college life and I had a friend who had his computer, and he never turned his computer off. I was using his computer. I went to turn it off. It was late at night. I was going home. He said, no, 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 don't turn it off. I've got a program running. I was like, oh, okay. What's your program? He's like, oh, it's called SETI. It's analyzing information that is being gathered from outer space and different radio waves and different noises and such. A noise might not be the right word. But it's analyzing this information that they're getting to try to see if there's, there's some kind of life out there on 
other planets. I found that to be fascinating. They, they, that was 20 years ago, 25 years ago almost. And, and nothing's come out of this program and, and what they are doing and what they are using people's computers to be processing. It's still going on now using this different program. Probably people setting up all kinds of computers to run this data. It doesn't take much to look through even just the recent history of the last century of people trying to look at this information or that information or look, this is in the sky and it's doing this and flying saucers were the big deal back in the 80s and into the early 90s. And they'd say, well, what technology could, could move like this, could go straight up or could go straight to the left or go straight to the right? Well, we have such technology now, do we not? We have, we're fighting wars with these kinds of technologies that are doing this. It is it is drones. There are even these things that came out earlier on where they would see these, these large, quiet, flying objects in the air. This has to be some kind of something from outer space, some kind of new alien technology in that which they drew, that which they described, ended up looking like a stealth bomber. What's interesting about this even is that scientific theory has, has tried to get into this idea. Scientific theory has tried to support the idea that, that there's got to be some other life from other planets. Someone like Richard, Richard Dawkins even put forward this idea. He was being interviewed by Ben Stein, and they were discussing the idea of intelligent design. Is, did God create the world? Did He bring all things into existence? Doesn't it make sense that there would be one who is the unmoved mover in Dawkins patently, so that's ridiculous. And he has his little statements that he makes, and he likes to use hyperbole and pejoratives to talk about anyone who is religious, most especially, I will emphasize, Christians. But it was so fascinating within that interview with Ben Stein that when they began to talk about problems in evolution, Richard Dawkins brought this point up. He said, well, it, it's quite possible, quite reasonable. In fact, he argued in his intelligent-sounding British accent, that there is an intelligent race from out in space that came down and seeded the planet Earth, which led to the opportunities in evolution that we have even now. It's foolishness. Man continues to look to the stars, look for intelligent life in different places, and they become fascinated. There's movies there's games and such on this idea of looking for some kind of a visitation, coming down, and someone bringing this greater wisdom. But Zechariah here talks about a, a true visitation, a, a, a true visitation from the one from whom all life came into existence. This is a true visitation, the one, the one who is, in fact, the creator of of life, the one who brought life into existence from absolutely nothing, the one from whom all life comes from, has its source, the one to whom, dear friends, each and every one of us will give an account. Do you believe that, dear friends? Do you believe that you will give an account one day? For that is a surety that is there. There is within you a desire for justice that can only be answered from the fact that you are a moral being that has been granted this understanding of morality from one who is a lawgiver, from one who is perfectly good. Zechariah speaks of this visitation of the Lord, and it's here at the birth of his son, John the Baptist, but most of his song as you, as you see, is not about John. It's talking about the Lord. It's talking about the work that the Lord is doing through this Messiah, through this one that has been prophesied, through this one that is there even then in the womb of Mary. It's interesting, the word that is used here, it is a verb that comes from the noun episkopos, and you probably recognize that word, episcopal, right? We get the word overseer, the noun overseer, from the word episkopos. And this is, this is the idea of how this works. It's basically like the idea of, uh, of a general coming down to, to inspect his troops, to, to, to see how they are, to, to walk into the ranks, to inspect and oversee things. This is the higher up one coming down to, to visit. There's many visitations 
from the Lord that you see within the Scriptures. Several times the Lord visited the people. Several times the Lord visited people. And this visitation from the Lord could be something that is positive or it could be negative. You imagine the Tower of Babel. You had the people that were there. They gathered together, right, in their rebellion against God using wisdom that they had gleaned from what the Lord had given to them, using technology that the Lord had given them the ability to use, using materials that the Lord had brought into existence, and they gathered to themselves these materials and this technology in their own worldly wisdom, and they began to build for themselves a great tower that they could reach the Lord as though they could reach the Lord through their own efforts. And the author there uses very specific words to communicate the foolishness of what they are doing. He uses anthropomorphic language there, right? Language that you can understand. And it talks about the Lord going down to see what they are doing. Well, God is omnipresent. We know that God is everywhere. We know that He doesn't actually have to go anywhere. He just is. But the author's communicating the idea with all of their efforts that they had put to that point, they had not even begun to begin to begin to reach the Lord. The Lord had to condescend to them even at that time to deal with them. And the Lord is condescending to us even in His dealing with us. He has condescended to us in revealing His glory in the creation he has condescended to us through special revelation in the Scriptures. He has condescended to us through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And even the visitation from the Lord within the Old Testament Scriptures is something that could be positive or negative based upon your own vantage point. Think about the visitation of the Lord as he descended there upon Egypt, and it was plague after plague after plague that fell upon Egypt. And for the Egyptians, it was extremely negative. Now, not negative for the ones, I would say, that ended up converting to the true religion and exited Egypt along with the Israelites. Don't forget that, that there are Egyptians that were saved that day, that left the land with the people. That is something that you see in the, uh, the cartoon version of that at the very end. Um, I'm not remembering the name of the movie right now, but at the very end of that movie, you see the different kinds of people that are there, and some of them are very clearly Egyptians that are leaving with the Israelites during that time. You think of the Passover. It was a very different experience for those that had the blood of the Lamb upon their door and those who did not. Zechariah is using that kind of language. He is using the language that we see in the Old Testament, most specifically during that time of the Exodus, the Israelites leaving Egypt, that time when the Lord was acting to redeem the people, to save them out of the clutches of slavery as they were serving under Pharaoh, this redemption of old. We, we, we see this even in, in Luke 1, and then beginning in, in verse 70, it says, As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the, the hand of all who hate us. This is later on in the passage right there. But we, what we have there is this is redemption that is being spoken of here. And this is what, what I want you to understand is that this redemption is a spiritual redemption. It is a, a saving of the people spiritually. This is not a, a political redemption. I want you to understand that. That, that is something that, that, that should be very clear at this point, but I was fascinated to see how so many commentators still continued to interpret Zechariah's prophecy here as though the Lord was setting up an earthly kingdom at this time, some of the liberal ones like to say that he intended to set up a liberal, a literal kingdom, and well, it just didn't work out. But there's still these great spiritual things that we can learn from him. But see this, as we talked about even earlier, and as we will see to continue to flow through the pages of this gospel as we walk through it, Jesus did not come into the world to set up a political kingdom. 
And this is something that was very difficult for many of the leaders, because when they read the words, they interpreted them to be that which is a literal kingdom, that which is an earthly kingdom, that which is having an earthly reign, that is which is having an earthly boundary of a, a nation state, of a nation state people group. But even here, as we've said, that there ended up being a destruction. This temple that had been built for close to 80 years ended up being destroyed in 66 A.D. by Titus the general four years after it was completed. Think of all the time, all of those decades that it had been built and built up and built up, and yet still I found a scholar like Daryl Bach, a great scholar on Luke and Acts, one that you can go to for many good uses and studying his understanding, but he came to this from a very dispensationalistic perspective. And I was shocked to see this, that he said this. He said, what we're looking at here is, is the fact that they were denied this political reality at this time because of their disobedience. But the Lord is going to bring that about in Israel in the future. See the tension that is there. That is not at all how you see Jesus communicating these ideas. That is not at all how the apostles are dealing with these texts. He argues that Israel's disbelief is at this time, and it's going to be the Gentiles for this point, and then the Lord is going to come back to Israel later on and then set up this nation state. And then I didn't bring my charts with me, so I won't go on from there. But that's not at all the perspective of this text. That's not the perspective of the prophets. That was not the perspective of Mary when she was singing her song. The enemies that Zechariah is speaking of here in this text are not Herod. The enemies that Zechariah is speaking of here is not the Roman Empire, right? The enemies could be removed. The Lord could have removed the Roman Empire. In fact, He will in time. The Lord could have removed Herod. In fact, in will, He will in time. But man's most serious issue would not have been solved, See, man's most serious issue is within his heart. He is worshiping the creation rather than the Creator. He is born dead in his trespasses and sins. This is not the rule of earthly kings that is being assuaged, but rather it is sin and the rule of Satan upon the people of God that is being removed. And so you can look at this as like Pharaoh was ruling over the Israelites, and that was being removed. And the, the work of the Lord happened during that time in a very specific way, in a very miraculous way. The Lord is doing that here. Jesus wasn't coming down to set up His earthly kingdom and earthly rule. He was reigning through the hearts of His people. You may say, so does it matter how you live? Absolutely it matters how you live. Does that mean we shouldn't be involved in government or politics? Absolutely, you should be involved in both of those, but not for the purpose of trying to establish some kind of a theocratic state. Spurgeon says this. I find this statement to be fascinating. He says, if God calls you to be a minister, don't stoop to being a king. That's Spurgeon speaking as a preacher, speaking of the nobility of serving in that position and how it is higher than serving as a king if the Lord has called you to serve in that particular position. And if he would say something like that about an earthly king and about an earthly preacher, what does it say when we envision Jesus doing this, that Jesus is going to come down and then rule over a particular nation state, rule over a particular piece of ground? He's going to condescend to earth? He's not going to do that. That, that would be a demotion. He is the king of the universe. He rules over all that is in existence, and he is working during this time to redeem his people, to save his people. I mean, what more words do we need than what Jesus says when he says, my kingdom is not of this world? And he makes that argument that my, my people... My disciples would have been gathering weapons to defend me at that time. In fact, one of them did, and he stopped them. He held them off. He's not raising up an earthly army to go and defeat enemies. He is raising up an army spiritually to go and accomplish his good work. 
that the Word and the Spirit would work in the hearts of the people because of the person and work of Christ Jesus. He's reigning in the hearts of men. There's many errors that come into this thought, many errors throughout history that have existed. You see this within the so-called Holy Roman Empire where you had this mixture of the Pope trying to get in the middle of each and every other country's business. You see that even now in the relationship between Russia and Ukraine. I find it absolutely fascinating that you see the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church seeking to make Christian arguments as to why the invasion of Ukraine is something that should be accepted, is something that is a blessing. I read at one point, he made a quote, he says, this is a matter of people's salvation. That's his view, that this nation state needs to be ruling over this particular area so that he can have his spiritual rule over these particular people, and that is the means through which they have their access to God. No, that is not what Zechariah is speaking of. And that is not the means that the Lord used for doing the work that He did. That's not the means that the Lord used to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the known world at the time in the first century. You see this redemptive language that Zechariah is using here that is hearkening them back to Egypt, this visitation of the Lord, this redemption of the people, the salvation of the people which is like that of the Exodus. As it says there in Luke 171, I'm just going to use one point of connection to, to support this argument, but we see that in Luke 171 that we should be safe from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. We have these passages, Mary's hymn and also Zacharias's hymn here and the two other hymns that we'll see going forward. They are saturated in Scripture. They are saturated in the Psalms and in the teachings of the prophets. But I want you to see, compare Luke 171 to Psalm 106.10. And it says, So he saved them from the hand of the foe and redeemed them from the power of the enemy. So the psalmist there is writing about the destruction of Pharaoh and his army. And Zechariah is using the same language here to talk about what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing through His work as a prophet, as a priest, and most especially right here as a king. The son that Elizabeth gave birth to, his name is John. And his name means God is grace. He's pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ, pointing to Jesus as the one who will accomplish this work for His people, that one that was hearkened to in the very early pages of Scripture, the one who will come forward and crush the head of the serpent. And we see this as the entirety of the Scriptures. And there's been some in recent times that are trying to make arguments that the Old Testament doesn't point to Christ. Or, or, or I read one, one scholar recently that says that none of Leviticus is pointing to Jesus and I saw one person respond. They said, no, look, I found it. And it began at the very beginning where it says, the Lord. This is not the understanding of the apostles. This was not the understanding of Jesus. All of Scripture points to Jesus. All of Scripture points to His work. We see Jesus doing that. We won't see it for many chapters to come. But He does it in Luke 24, beginning in verse 27. It says, at the beginning and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the Scriptures, the things concerning himself. And so he's walking through the entirety of the Scriptures, showing the people there on the road to Emmaus how they point to him. I'm going to give a quote from one named Bishop Browning, and he says this about the entirety of the Scriptures. He says, the whole volume of Scripture did prophesy of him. He was the sum and scope of their predictions. He was Abraham's promised seed, Abraham's Isaac, Jacob's silo, Moses' great prophet, Isaiah's Emmanuel, Ezekiel's shepherd, Daniel's holy one, Zechariah's branch, Malachi's angel, all of them predictions of his coming. He was Abel's sacrifice, Noah's dove, Abraham's first fruits, Aaron's rod, the Israelites' rock, 
the patriarchs, manna, David's tabernacle, Solomon's temple, all these prefigured his incarnation. They were folds and swathing bands of this babe, Jesus. All scriptures are pointing to Christ and pointing to this work that Jesus will accomplish in the hearts of his people, in the lives of his people, bringing about real change within them. Pray, dear friend, that you are one who has seen the fullness of Christ. For when you look upon Christ, when you see the fullness of Christ, you see the richness of Christ, you see the beauty of Christ, you see not merely someone who is a great moral example that we can sing a hymn about and just say, well, dare to be a Daniel. Dare to be like Jesus. No, you look upon Jesus and you say, I, I can't dare to be like Jesus. I'm not even close to being like Jesus. I have been born dead in my trespasses and sins. I'm unable to act for myself. I'm unable to walk in righteousness. I've been defiled before God. I'm one who is stained by sin, and the wrath of God is over me. I have no hope. I cannot trust in man's religion. I cannot trust in my best efforts. But Jesus, Jesus, this one that Zacharias speaks of, this one who is the visitation from God, this one who has come down, this one who is tabernacling amongst the people, is one who has solved man's greatest issues. For we have two great issues in our humanity. Fallen humanity, if I can qualify it. And the first is that we are born dead in our trespasses and sins. We have inherited upon us the guilt of our forefather, Adam. He is one who acted on our behalf. That is why you're born into this world fallen. That's why you're born into this world with the effects of sin even upon you. That is why we die. The wages of sin is death. So we do not keep the law even on our best day, and we have broken the law. So we don't keep the law, and we have broken the law. Both of those are issues. But Jesus has accomplished both of these on behalf of his people. Jesus has taken upon himself the fullness of the consequences of our sin. He has taken upon himself, he being the sacrificial lamb, he being the one who is perfect, has taken upon himself the fullness of the consequences of our sins, that whoever believes upon him can be saved. The wrath of God doesn't have to fall upon you. You don't have to spend eternity in hell. You can be saved God has made a way, and it's not through your efforts. It's not through your best works. It's not through your wisdom. It is through the work of Christ. And Jesus not only took upon himself the consequences of our sins, for if that's all he did, you'd be sitting in the same place as Adam and Eve. See, but Jesus fulfilled the law in every respect. Jesus never sinned in any way, and he always did what was right. So your sins are imputed to him. Your sins are given to him. They fall upon him. The wrath of God fell upon him, and his righteousness is granted to you. I would encourage you children to read a story written by R.C. Sproul, and it's called The Priest with Dirty Clothes, and it gives a great explanation of this story through a story for children about a priest that was going forward. He was going to visit the king, and he slipped, and he fell, and his clothes were dirty, and if he went in to see the king with his filthy garments, there would be great consequences that would fall upon him, but the son of the king gave to him his clothes, and he took upon himself the dirty clothes of that priest, and the man was able to go forward and visit the king and that is what Jesus accomplished. Our sins were imputed to him, and his righteousness was imputed to us. And we have an inheritance in Christ. We have the benefits of Christ. As though we had fulfilled the law perfectly, as though we had never sinned. That's the beauty of what we have in Christ. And that is what the Lord is accomplishing here through Christ Jesus, working this in the hearts of the people. So we have this redemptive visitation. We have this redemptive covenant, this redemptive covenant. I'm only going to deal with verse 69 
at this point. And it says, And he raised up the horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. Now, he's hearkening back to the Davidic covenant. Gabriel introduced this earlier when he was speaking in his prophecy to Mary. As I said before, Mary introduced the Abrahamic covenant in her magnificent, um, and we're going to deal with that next week. But Zechariah also deals with the Abrahamic covenant. I want to spend some time and talk about the Abrahamic covenant, and I want to walk through the context of the Abrahamic covenant. We see this, we, we see this in a few different places, and I'll, I'll go into it in more detail next week, but the Abrahamic covenant, as it's going to tie into what we're talking about here in the Davidic covenant, we see that in Genesis 17 and verse 6. The Lord says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And then again in verse 16 of chapter 17 of Genesis, the Lord says, I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Now, this promise of this kingship in the Davidic covenant is going to narrow down to the tribe of Judah, and is going to narrow down ultimately to the line of David. Now, these covenants the Davidic covenant also exists there within the Mosaic covenant. It was tied to the Mosaic covenant in that there was a, a covenant of works. The obedience of the people would result in their blessing, or the disobedience would result in curses. If they were obedient, they would get the blessings from the Lord. They would thrive in the land. If they were disobedient, they would have to fall upon themselves the curses and the plagues that fell upon the Egyptians. And in the Mosaic Covenant, all the people, when the, when the law was read to them, said, all of this we shall do. And you've read the story. They didn't do all that they said they would do. Judges 2, beginning at verses 10 and 11, says, And all the generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there across another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and serve the Baals. And so it continues there in verse 20 of Judges 2. It says, So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and said, Because my people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out all the nations that Joshua had left when he died. And this was a time when there was no king. As it says, everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. So we see that in verse 25. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes, and the people continued to insist upon the king. And they said, we want a king. And they want a king, not the king that had been promised to them, not the king that the Lord would grant to them, not the king that would lead them in righteousness, but they wanted a king that would be like the nations. And they were warned by the prophet, this one will take away your children. This one will will tax you. There's going to be a cost for this king that you desire. And so there's conditional aspects of the Davidic covenant. I'm going to walk through two points there. I want you to, there's conditional aspects that if these are kept, then the Lord is going to grant these particular blessings. And there's also aspects, and this is what I want you to see here, there's unconditional aspects. But even when I say unconditional aspects, you need to understand that the conditions were met not by someone who came from ordinary generation from the line of David, but rather were met in Christ. So even in these, what we say, unconditional aspects of the covenant, they were conditional, but Christ met those conditions. It's kind of like I would talk to you. You know, I, I remember Dr. Renahan began his, his talk at Semper Reformanda and he got everyone's attention. He said, I'm going to preach to you about how you are saved by works. And everyone immediately, he had everyone's attention. Oh, we're saved by what, What's going on here? Did I just spend $30 to listen to heresy? And then he went on to say that you're not saved by your works, but by Christ's works. So when we talk about the fact that you're saved by grace, we talk about that there's a covenant of grace that you're saved by. It doesn't mean that there's no works involved. 
It means that they're not your works that are involved in saving you. It produces good works in you ultimately through the work of the Lord, but your works aren't the means whereby you're made right before God. Your works aren't the means where you are gaining the benefits of the covenant before God. That's how I want you to understand this. So let's look at some conditional aspects of the Davidic covenant. 2 Kings chapter 2 and verses 1 through 4. And it says this, when David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon and his son, saying, I am about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways, keeping his statutes, his commands, his rules, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons pay close attention to their way to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of David. And so you understand that what followed from that was not sons that were obedient to the law of Moses. Solomon became very disobedient to the law of Moses. His son came forward from him and led to a civil war amongst the people. They both fell into idolatry, and they both ended up being taken away in exile. But here's what I want you to see, is that there is an aspect of the Davidic covenant where the Lord is saying, this is going to happen. He doesn't tell how it's going to happen, but he says this is going to happen. That's a tension that was there. With, with, the pro, with the people reading the Scriptures as they were in exile, there's always going to be one on the throne of David. His throne will be established forever and ever. We don't even have a land right now. We're out in exile. We don't have a king right now. Where is this line of David? So the tension was there. The tension was real. And we see that in, let's begin there in Samuel 7, verses 12 and 13. It says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will rise up your, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. The Lord says this is what he is going to do. He is going to raise this one up. It's going to be established forever. And even as they were in rebellion against the Lord, Even as they were beginning to be taken into exile, the prophets were continuing to remind them of this. Jeremiah 23, beginning in verse 5, says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as a king and deal wisely, shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. And the days of Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he shall be called, The Lord is our Righteousness. Isaiah, again, um, goes off of that same theme, talking about this, this line of David in Isaiah 9 and verse 7. Of the increase of his government and of the peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice, with righteousness, from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And so this is the theme that is being brought here onto the pages of Scripture here in the first century. This is what they're speaking of, this promised one that is going to come, that is going to be from the line of David, that is going to be established forever and ever. You see that from Gabriel in verse 32 of Luke 1. He says, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Gabriel makes it very clear that this one that will come from the womb of Mary is one that will be this promised king that will sit upon the throne of David And we have this promise as well. Furthermore, um, in 2 Samuel 7, it says, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and plant them so that they may dwell in their own place to be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. This is what Zechariah is pointing to as being in Christ. The fulfillment of what Christ will do As it says there in 71, we read it earlier, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. This is coming about through the line of David, 
through the horn of salvation. That's in verse 69 of Luke 1. Raise up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. That's one that may not immediately connect with you, but this idea, think of these people, very agrarian. All right, we don't have a lot of animals running around here with horns. Animals with horns generally don't make good pets, so you're not going to have them in your backyards. But think about something even, even like, like a rhino with, with the horn that they have and, and the power that is there, the strength of that horn. I know some of you will say, well, it's not a horn. It's really made of hair. Yeah, it is. I understand that. It's called a, a cerno. But if I said the cerno, no one would know what I was talking about. So appreciate your love of the Discovery Channel. But the horn of the rhino that is there is, is, is very hard. It's very strong. And I want you to, to understand that the entirety of the power of that animal, all of the force that is created by the mass of that rhino and through the speed of that rhino running forward is all right there in that small little area of the horn. So even having a small, smaller horn for an animal like that makes it even more powerful than having a really large horn because it's all there centered, the power that the animal is creating through its movement. And as it's driving into another creature, it's driving right in there. That's the idea that is here. This is, the horn is symbolic of power. This is the power of the Lord that is coming forward out of the line of David. The power of the Lord, and He's going to establish His kingdom. He's going to bring about His good purpose. And this is the Lord condescending. This is the Lord coming down. This is the Lord in His visitation reaching down to us and reaching down to us in His strength. See, man's religion is like we said earlier, man's religion is like those that tried to put up the Tower of Babel, those that were with all their efforts and their technology and their wisdom trying to build upward, upward to God, and they didn't even begin to begin to reach God. So the Lord had to come down. The Lord had to come down to us. He had to condescend to us. And Zacharias speaks of this one, this horn of salvation, as though it had already occurred. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David. That's what he's speaking of. This is what he is pointing to in Christ, the one who has been brought, speaking of it as though it has occurred, speaking of it as though the effects of this horn are already effectual, already influencing people. And the truth is they were. People had been being saved by the work of Christ prior to His even coming. Those prior to the cross were not trusting in their best efforts. They weren't trusting in their abilities to make this sacrifice or that, or that sacrifice. They were trusting in the one who was to come, trusting in this one that would come. Those sacrifices they did pointed forward to Christ, pointed forward to the necessity of Christ. But the fullness of the sacrifices that happened day after day after day after day in the tabernacle and in the temple point to their insufficiency, pointed to the need of the Lord to condescend, the Lord to come down, the Lord to act, the Lord to work in His own strength him bringing about this covenant that he had promised to David, that one would reign, that we would have King Jesus reigning and ruling over us. We would have King Jesus as our protector. That is, that is what Zacharias speaks of, and that is what is being introduced here, is the beauty of the visitation of the Lord, the Lord coming down during this time in the person and the work of Jesus and the Lord fulfilling fulfilling this covenant that was confusing people for so many years. Where is the throne of David? Who will sit upon this throne of David? How is it that he will reign forever and ever? It is through the person and work of Christ Jesus. That is what Zechariah is singing of during this time. That is what the fullness of the ceremonies that Zechariah as a priest was pointing to, pointed to, even in his time as a priest. This redemptive visitation 
in this redemptive covenant, in the Davidic covenant. Oh, dear friends, please see this beauty. There is no religion like true religion. There is no religion in man's religion. There is no hope. It is you doing your best efforts, you putting your best foot forward, you trying to improve here or there, you justifying yourself by comparison. But in Christ, you have one who has done all that is necessary. You have one who has kept the law in every respect. And you have one who has taken upon himself the fullness of sin, fullness of the consequences of sin that you so rightly deserve, that you can be saved if you will but, but trust upon him, if you will but believe upon him, if you will see your need of him, if you will turn from your sin and turn to Christ. There is hope, there is life, and there is salvation in the risen Lord Jesus Christ who sits upon the throne of David and rules over his people and protects his people and has saved them, saved them, redeemed them from their enemies, which is sin and death. Oh, let's pray.